Welcome back to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. We're talking CSEC IT, but specifically data communications and data transmissions. In the last 20 or 30 years, when you were using telephones and you wanted to call somebody abroad, you had to call an operator and that operator would give you a line directly into um, the US at another operator. And then there came the time when we had to do things like using an ICAS number that was about 20 digits long in order for you to call directly. And that was extremely tedious, but there was a need for communication. And sometimes, unfortunately, we tend to interchange or interuse the Def the definitions basically transmission and communication um, but they tie in with each other and so to start let us just look at a formal definition for uh, data communication and that essentially means it's an exchange of data between a source and a receiver via some kind of transmission medium and that transmission medium can be anything it can be ear um, it can be wires whatever the case is so that essentially is data communication the idea of exchanging information and i'll make this point real quickly um, when we are doing data communications it's quite clear that there has to be some kind of understanding between both but we'll go into that a little bit later all right, and then data transmission, we can define as the process of sending a digital or analog signal via communication media to one or more computing networks or using any electronic device. Um, and I want you to try your best to make a distinction between the two, because if you do, what will happen is that you can be able to answer your questions properly and, and of course, assimilate what you're being asked during the exam. All right, um, <clears throat> now let me just look at what we really mean by communication and even though this is IT sometimes we need to go across disciplines in order to look at how they gel together now the process of communication is basically you are exchanging information between individuals take the IT out of it completely you communicating with somebody all right that is communication but there are certain things that you need to pay attention to when you're communicating good the person who you're speaking to or you're sending the message to must be able to receive the message when they receive the message, they must be able to say, okay, yes, I received the message and I understand what you're saying. And so when we talk about communication, there is a sense of satisfaction in terms of receiving and sending messages. Can you imagine now, if I call you on the phone and said hello and you didn't answer, then I wouldn't have any confirmation of whether or not you are on the line. In communication, there has to be some kind of understanding between um, the parties and so where that understanding is concerned I remember uh, one of my cousins told me that when they went abroad they were told you know uh, let me let me hear you speak some patwa and then of course they would possibly say something in patwa and you know everybody would just like yo <laughs> what you didn't just say and sometimes they'd even curse and, and, and they'll be wondering, yo, that sounds great, let's hear it again. But the idea is they didn't understand what they were hearing, but irrespective of that, they embraced it. And so in communication, there must be understanding. And so we have a couple of things that we need to look at and just to give you an example of what I mean. If you can read this, you tell me. I'm going to try to read it. Uh, this is supposed to be a patwa official patwa and this is the first word is k-a-a -A. anybody can pronounce that ka you see well here's how it reads ka you see god love the world and and the world is w-o-r-l so much that d-a-t him get up him one dege dege boy pick me <laughs> See, cameraman, they might laugh after me. <laughs> so, anybody who trusts and trusts spell, listen to what trust spell C H O S. Trust. Ina, him, now go dead, but I go live forever. Now, I'm not telling you This comes directly from the New Testament, part of the Bible. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, part of I believe, is a language, whether or not we think it is. Um, Practically, it's a language we use it, but you know, there are things that you have to go into language, you have to standardize certain things, etc. But hear me now, me can't read Patois. 
I definitely have to go back to school <laughs> to learn Pata. All right. But we know that part that come from John 3, 16, and you know the English, uh, you should know the English version. All right. So what are the important things when it comes to communication? It must, between, must be between a couple of individuals. And there must, be a, there must be content. There must be information. Thirdly, there must be a standard way in which the content is represented. And there must be understanding, which means a common understanding between the parties communicating. And that is true for us in real life. And, of course, we have to adapt that very same things when it comes to computers. The computers that are communicating must be able to say, yes, I received the message. The one who is sending it should be say, yeah, I just sent you some messages. The other one should be say, okay, I received the message, thank you. So that level of communication, even though we know it from a human perspective, the computers have to use that as well, or we have programmed them to do that very kind of thing. The information, of course, we know that computers use zeros and ones, but then we have to be able to give, get the information that we know into zeros and ones because they understand that zeros and ones. All right. The symbolism, of course, we know what that means. We learn uh, English, we learn math, whatever the case is, and there are symbols associated with them. There are symbols associated with computers as well. And of course, we say it's common. That means both parties, both computers have to understand what is going on with this, with this information or this communication. And there is one thing, however, missing from the list that I have here, and that's the transmission media. What? facilitates the move of information from one place to the next all right <clears throat> and that's where we come up with the whole thing of transmission and the use of computer networks so what are the differences that we need to pay attention to well we there are some problems when it comes to data communication and transmission and there are here are those three that we need to take take consideration of um, one there are different kind of devices that want to communicate there are different network facilities, all right? There are different communication media. And because of these differences, we have to really, really think about how we're going to allow computers to connect and how we allow them to transmit media. Um, here's a big problem. Very early when computers came into being, um, and, and let me just plug here, big up to all the... <laughs> the early hackers they were the persons who were responsible for the small computers we have today they were larger computers and what they did was to try to figure out how these larger computers work and try to miniaturize them so that we could use them so hackers were possibly one of the reasons why we have the small computers we have today but the idea was we would have several different computers all over the world Everybody having their own kinds of standards. Everybody having either a larger or smaller computer. Computers running at different speeds, different distances, but they all wanted to share resources. They all wanted to be able to share information. And that was the crux of that, well, the crux that caused the invention of data communication. All right? And so that is why now we have to give all the kudos to the persons who came up with the idea of transmitting information and so everybody wanted to connect and one of the places that i could ask you to go to um, if you have internet access wherever you are is to watch the video by um I, i'm trying to pronounce it properly me lie bill gill the history of the internet um and they will give you a, pr a pretty um good synopsis of what it is or what internet what the internet truly come about or how it came about all right um so let's look at some of the problems or some of the issues first let's say you wanted to communicate um between two machines basically across the table it's a pretty short distance and so right there you know you could possibly easy well send things or whatever the case is um then we have the idea of communicating you know within a house possibly you're in your bedroom and somebody else in the dining room and of course that's also a pretty short distance and so the proximity is not really a, a problem what becomes a problem is that now when you're in a house and you're in different parts of the house there are obstacles that your communication has to 
has to deal with. You know, it has to deal with walls, it has to deal with furniture, it has to deal with your body. So what will happen now that we have that kind of thing happening? Um, what about, you know, information running from TVJ all the way to Kelitz? The problem gets a little bigger. The proximity is a definite problem, the distance is a problem, as well as, of course, obstacles. There might be mountains, there might be trees, right? And so, as we design these things, we have to have that into consideration. And then we have the, let's say we're going from Mexico, or we're going from Montego Bay to Mexico, or they're about. That's a pretty long distance. But not only that, we have to contend with the ocean, right? Same thing for if we were running to possibly China. We have to contend with a lot of different things. But closer to home, if we wanted to connect everything that we have or we need, um, or the idea of connecting would be something like we're trying to connect every little thing. And what that would honestly mean is that it's a complete level of confusion that makes absolutely no sense. Your phone being connected to your computer, your computer being connected to your laptop. The idea is, because of all these little obstacles, we had to create some kind of standard. And those standards define how we communicate. And we spoke about the use of FTP, the use of TC, TCIP, TCPIP last week, I think it was our week before. Um, we talked about all these mailing protocols, etc. All right. But there had to be physical or there had to be standards for the physical connection. And that is where we're talking about transmission media. We had to have some way of connecting and keeping everything sensible. Everything had to make sense. And so there had to be standards about the communication. There had to be standards about the devices that we use. There had to be standards about what connects these devices. And that's what we're going to try to jump into today. So, what is a computer network? Let us start there. A network is basically the connection of computer devices with the aim of sharing information and resources. And that, that's pretty simple, but sometimes we leave off the idea of sharing resources. And that resources mean actual physical resources, sharing like a printer, sharing like a file server, you know, things like that. And those things are what we call resources, the physical things on the, net, on the network that we could possibly use. And so, because we have all these different kind of devices on the network, the connection between them has to make sense or the connection that takes place must make sense. When you're at school and possibly you have an e-learning lab, um, shout out to e-learning Jamaica, uh, they might have created a lab space where you have a printer that is connected directly to a switch. All right, And that printer being connected to the switch using your LAN cable. And then everything else, all the computers there are connected to the switch because the switch now forms this central place where the connection takes place or where the information exchange can take place. All right? And then possibly inside your switch, you have a router or your router is connected directly to your switch. And that router is now connected using a coaxial cable or an ordinary dial-up phone line that goes to cable and wireless or goes to um, Digicel's exchange. And so the switch now has, is now able to communicate or is able to distribute or help distribute or help identify what is on the network and how to get information to them. And so the focus then will be on what these connections are. And we have wired connections and wireless connections. The wired connections are what we call, are about three of them. Twisted pier, coaxial cable, and fiber optic cable. Your twisted pier is, starts with your phone lines essentially. All right, now many of you don't know or have not seen this before, but it looks sort of like a LAN cable, but it's pretty smaller. And it's smaller because it only has about four, four small wires going through it. All right, and the speeds are, are fairly slow, but years ago, when you wanted to connect to the internet, you'd have this particular phone cable being connected to a modem that was inside your computer. And whenever you try to connect to the internet, you'd actually hear the modem making a dial tone. 
or something of a dial tone. And that dialing would actually be a number. And you as a user would definitely have to use some kind of a, a number or type in some kind of a number, or phone number that you would be provided by your internet service provider. And that dial up takes place directly, um, directly through that dial up line. Now, as that dial up takes place, what is happening with your modem is that it's converting all the digital information from your computer into analog information. And that analog information is what traverses over the phone line. All right, And of course, it's, it's normally, uh, well, it's, it's there for a voice band, we normally call it. All right? But then the, this continued changing of information um, that your modem does forces that digital signal converts it to the kind of signal that can be carried over your internet access over um over your phone line and then give you internet access all right um the speed is normally about 10 megabits per second and we know that is pretty slow um by by our estimations or by what we are using now um, the other form of twisted pair is the LAN cable that we know, but it's truly what we call an Ethernet cable. All right? um, you might call it a LAN cable, but it's an Ethernet cable based on the standard. The speed depends on the category that is being used. And if you search it on the internet, you'll find that it goes all the way up to CAT6. All right? And this allows, or it's been created to handle certain speeds. And of course, we call it we call them twisted pair. And you might be wondering why do we call it twisted pair? And the truth is, we call it twisted pair because inside the wire itself, there are possibly strands of twisted wire. And these um, they are colored. They are normally colored because what happens here is that we want to have a standard as well as to how um, we we create these transmission media. And so we have about well in your cat cable or in your ethernet cable you have about four twisted pairs which are about eight wires um, and most of them are unshielded uh, the cat six i think is shielded and the reason for shielding is because we want to make sure that there isn't any interference and the reason for twisting as well is to ensure that there's less interference or no interference from each other um, and you might be wondering how that makes sense well if if you've been watching most of schools not out you would have possibly been watching the physics class. Yes, I tell you, people with money are business people around the world, but scientists and physicists built it. If you check the physics class, or you should, you should request it, you'll remember where you're being taught that anytime a current runs along a piece of wire, then it creates an electromagnetic field around the wire. Now, even though you will see one small um, circle here representing the electromagnetic field. That electromagnetic field is running all along the wire. And that field in and of itself can cause interference and might even be susceptible to interference. And how that field is generated is because simply because the electrons in the wire running in a particular direction or allowing the current to pass along in, the, in a particular direction causes that kind of um, electromagnetic response and so the twisting of the wire somehow enables the negation or the reduction of the amount of interference there and so when you are running your cat cable etc that must be understood that depending on the type you're working with or depending on the environment that you're working working with you want to ensure that there's very little interference all right and in in your wires because that can cause in cause the loss of information all right so you want to pay attention to that as well uh then we have the coaxial cable now this is what you should be acquainted with if you have internet at home uh for the last couple of years this is what flow has been rolling out you you get this directly into your cable box and you should get this directly into your router as well and it's the word coaxial actually means um a solid core or one one um common core and that's where the word coaxial cable comes from because your core this small copper wire runs in the middle of the wire or of the cable and of course it is shielded by something that feels almost like plastic and that particular um that particular wire is brings the majority of the signal but also there's a aluminum sheeting around it and 
if there's interference along the wire or anywhere else, the interference will uh, interact with the sheeting and not necessarily harm the wire that's carrying the main signal. All right, and so it's important if you have a cable at home and you're just pushing the wire alone and not screw it on because the sheeting, of course, uh, connects to the, the what you'd call the ground or you could possibly call the ground that you screw onto your, onto your TV. And so you want those things intact so that you can ensure that you have very little interference. All right, and so your coaxial cable is more or less, it's, it's a little bit faster than the particular um, cat cables that we're using or the ethernet cables that we're using and it might support up to 300 megabits per second so it's pretty fast and pretty fast for our our needs um, I think the latest uh, I checked I think cable and wireless well flow is offering about 150 megabits per second on, on its strongest um, right now but this can support it um, very very easily um, then the the other wire is the fiber optics and this is the wire that rules them all and, and I say wire loosely because it's not really wire it's actually a plastic or it's actually plastic or um, fiberglass or one of those materials and it's very important that those people who handle this kind of thing they are they are trained and certified because this allows for the transmission of data via light and what happens here is that light is extremely 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 fast extremely fast all right and what what we, we want to think about when we talk about the speed is the idea of how fast this thing is according to physics again um light, light travels at about 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and that is the speed at which that light is coming inside the, the cable. And if that is the case, then anything that fast is going to generate heat. And if it, if it, if it gets hot, you don't want to be near it. You don't want to necessarily have a lot of contact with it. You don't want your skin to get in contact with it, whatever. But how fast is 3.0 times 10 to, the, 10 to the 8 meters per second? Well. Let's do it in terms of what we know. You seeing, <laughs> you seeing both the fastest man in the world can run, or let's say stop speed. Well, I don't remember exactly, but it's supposed to be 9.5 seconds or a little bit <laughs> less, right? But he runs 100 meter in about 9.5 seconds, which means the average speed over the 100 meter is about 10.5 meters per second. So he's running that fast per second now if the speed of light is three times 10 to the 10 to the 8 meters per second it means therefore this speed of light is about 28 million or 29 million times faster than you're seeing which means that you could circumnavigate the globe in about about seven times before you see and finishes 100 meters so this is how fast that light is traveling along this particular wire. And whenever we talk about the backbone of a network or the backbone of a network in a country, it's normally fiber. And when flow came, you, you should have seen it, when flow came um, or started their infrastructure, the roads were being dug up and all of that, and they were laying fiber wires, I believe. All right? And to go on to a little bit more physics, one of the reasons why light is used at that speed is because light has a property that, call, that is, well, not the light, but there are mediums with a certain kind of property, what we call the total internal reflection. And what, what happens there is that the light is just reflecting at a certain angle so that it can travel through um, the, the core or, or, or through the, the plastic that's there. And so that is how fast we're talking about having to have information and communication between between individuals and between um, different societies. When, when um, I think it was France, France was focused on, a, I think it was scientific research and all of that. They had their computers from different places all over France being linked because they wanted to share the information. And can you imagine having to share information and dial up or the amount of information? That would make absolutely no sense. We needed to have the information and we needed to have it quickly. Just as how we have this information coming in 
um, about COVID-19 and we are getting the information quickly. Sometimes this information is extremely critical and the speed at which we get this information could mean the loss or salvation of lives. And so the, the, the fiber optic is by far one of the fastest, uh, well, if not the fastest um, wire uh, kind of connection that we have. What we need to pay attention to where your exams are concerned is how, when we would when would we use these kinds of connections? When would we use fiber? When would we use coaxial cable? And normally you'd use this when your terrain is not really bad, and of course you can have an, a, a literal physical connection, all right? And so you, that is what you need to pay attention to. And don't expect your questions to come in the form of you know what is the speed? You would have to know the speed beforehand, and in your knowing the speed beforehand, you can apply what you know to the question. Now we're going to look at the wireless connections. And the very first one that we look at is the Bluetooth. Everybody should know Bluetooth by now. Um, we have headphones that run on Bluetooth technology. Uh, you, you name it. Uh, one of the good things about Bluetooth is basically the specifications around it really lends itself to low voltage and short distances and that might not seem like a big benefit but consider the fact that you can use things like a headphone or you can use um, you can share information between a laptop or share information with your friends share files with your friends you know that proximity problem has been solved one of the good things also is that even though the amount of data per second or the speed of it is pretty small is that because it operates at such a, a low level of current there is very little interference related to bluetooth and so if you're doing other things you know your bluetooth might not interfere with it however i would not advise you to use your bluetooth in a hospital where they have life critical machines running um, but it's a very, very, very nice tool. Uh, and of course, what, what I'd like to encourage some of you to think about doing, maybe you're, you're at fifth form and, and that's fine. But if you want to become a computer professional, you know, you can even create your own Bluetooth device. There are specifications on the web that can help you create your own device and create your own, you know, you, you might come up with something better than our headphones, you know, and, and then what you do is just to get the specifications. You get the pieces of program that build the software, create your own, your, your own Bluetooth device. That's, that would be great. I'd love to see a Bluetooth device coming out of, out of Jamaica. All right. Um, so your Bluetooth uh, has speeds of about 3 to 24 megabits per second and the range is about 10 meters. Um, and 10 meters, for those of you who are more interested in feet, is about 31 feet. Which means that, of course, after that, you basically drop the signal or there's no connection. But be, and also, because it's very weak in terms of power, uh, it's, it's prone to obstacles as well. So even though you have a 30, 31 foot span between its distance or 10 meter, if there are obstacles in the way, you know, walls, whatever, the signal, of course, is greatly diminished. And so it's, that's why it is suited for close, um, close communication. Um, and you could test it at your home, of course. Uh, two devices connected to each other and, and just walk away and see what happens. You'd find that as you try to share things, they, they end, you end up dropping the signal and nothing is shared. And of course, we're talking about, when we're talking about Bluetooth, we're talking about radio waves. The same kind of, well, see, almost the same kind of radio waves that run radio communications anywhere but of course there's a difference in frequency or it operates at a certain frequency and so that is where the interference problem is also changed because it operates at a certain frequency it it won't necessarily interfere with other things operating at different frequencies in the same vicinity and so that's a, a great thing um if i should say so then we have Wi-Fi connections, which everybody, of course, has been using um, uh, or is using. Every particular router that comes into your home is Wi-Fi um, wi ready. And then I think some of the modems or some of the routers that Flow is using, they are possibly equipped for 5G. 
and, 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 and that's pretty fast as well. Uh, so we're looking at about 100 megabits per second generally. And then the distance is about 300 meters. So you, you can have a larger um, distance where that is concerned. But again, all signals can be hampered by, by um, obstacles in their way. Uh, with Wi-Fi, depending on the frequency at which it operates, you will find that, or the, you'll find that its distance will decrease. And the ones that we are now using with the 4G technology, the wavelength is, a, is, is what we call a long wavelength which simply means that the way how it operates or the frequency is, it might even be different from something else or from a 5G, but it allows for, for that distance. And then as, as the world or some places move to 5G, you will find that they have to have more repeating towers or more places where the signal can bounce off of because your 5G is operating at a higher frequency with a shorter wavelength and short wavelength waves or radio waves don't go very far. And so if, if 5G comes to a particular um, country, a particular, particular city, you'll find that they have to have several repeaters all over. And even in, in a small area, you'll have to have all two or three repeaters depending on the wavelength of, of your 5G. But you, that's your Wi-Fi. And you know, it's, we, 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 we can say for the most part that your Wi-Fi is pretty stable or and, and, and the interference level is, is pretty small because there, well, in Jamaica, there is much competing um, with your Wi-Fi signals, um, especially in your homes or wherever. Uh, with that said, we'll take a, a, a brief look at your mobile networks. Now, we know our mobile networks, uh, GSM, whatever the case is, operated from 2G to 3G to 4G. And what it allows for is internet and, and data communication over your, over your radio waves or over your radio signals. All right? And some of you might remember this peanut, well, not some of you, but there was a peanut phone years ago <laughs> where basically 2G that only allows for talking and text. Uh, and then we came to 3G that allowed for multimedia communications over the over the radio waves and then 4g now which we are now using we have improved speed broadband kind of capabilities you know with wireless and all that and of course you have great speeds with this and you can get music pictures movies etc and that's what that's what um, your mobile networks are about <laughs> <laughs> 